the basic concepts upon which the book Self Unfoldment was written. There is one more undertone or undercurrent which I would like to especially emphasize. We know that the human being grows primarily through experience. And experience is a participation, an actual doing. It is not merely an observation as one separate from an action, nor is it a kind of instruction in which we seek to benefit principally from the achievements of others or the records of ancient ways and manners. The entire concept of experience is immediate and vital, and there can be no change wrought in the nature of man without the dynamic of experience. It must naturally follow that all disciplines set up philosophically to advance the unfoldment of man's nature must in some way lead to or participate in experience. Now man may experience outwardly through the testimonies of his sensory perceptions. Or he may experience inwardly through the testimonies of certain other powers or faculties within himself. By experience, all processes of growth are given life, are made to be alive, so that we grow not by living upon the dead, but upon by living upon life. For the moment knowledge is dead, it can no longer give life. So long as we depend upon words or formulas or attitudes which have no immediate vitality in them, we are deprived of the nutrition upon which spiritual achievement must grow in order to attain its proper maturity. Thus we have in the older disciplines certain concentrative exercises that have as their peculiar purpose that man shall experience something within himself, that his concept of I believe shall be transformed into a deeper and more sustaining conviction I know. This changing of believing into knowing is possible in outward things through participation. The man who studies carpentry for a lifetime must yet pick up the hammer and the saw and create something if he is to know the meaning of the great concept of carpentry. All theory may contribute, but only does it give the skill for actual achievement. The achievement must be, or the experience is deficient. Now, it is not possible for man in the search for interior value to merely use the experience instruments which he has developed for material things. He must have new kinds of experiences. And these are to a measure made possible by a kind of visualization, the actual interior experiencing of something, held to be true, known to be sacred, and regarded as of the most primary importance. Concentrational and meditational procedures, therefore, involve a gradual transformation of method, 
leading in the end to the individual actually being part of something, sharing in insight, rather than merely beholding truth as from a distant mountain. Thus we have in most of our older disciplines, we believe that the mandala or the concentration image gradually attains a life of itself so that man beholds with inner faculty the very processes which he first intellectually recognizes in the symbolic diagrams and figures. Thus, these figures seem to come to life as in the story of the Zen mystics. These things abstractly contemplated suddenly become real, and in their reality they impinge themselves upon our consciousness as experience. We can think about a tree. We can examine the tree. We can spend a lifetime studying its species and its distribution upon the earth. We may, as physicians, consider it for its possible remedial qualities. We may build houses of its wood. We may thatch roofs with its branches. Yet all of these give us only certain experiences of the tree. The doctor's experience is that peculiar to the physician. He discovers the tree to be a, an agent of healing. The carpenter sees in it the rough materials of his work and transforms it into various uh, shapes, chairs and tables and walls. He also has an experience of trees, a very simple one, but a very direct one. So a dozen different persons with different interests will each have a different experience of this tree. The tired and weary person will rest in its shade and give thanks for its branches. Birds will nest in its clustered twigs. All these experiences are about trees. No one can deny their validity. Yet we search even deeper, because man, endowed with other faculties than those for superficial acquaintance, must search for the mystery of tree in itself. He seeks to experience the life of tree, and he realizes that this life flows outward through the branches reaching out to light and air. He sees and senses the tree as a living, total being. And in the study of its total expression, man becomes acutely aware of the tree's symbolic expression of the great principles of nature. The tree is a symbol of eternal life growing up, growing out as man grows in a slightly different and more diagrammatic way, but no less truthful or truthful in its depiction. To feel or know the life of the tree requires that kind of constant attention and understanding that we may attribute uh, to the de dedicated God who gives his life to growing things. He has discovered more than the carpenter can ever know. And yet, perhaps, this other, deeper man cannot build a chair. There are degrees of insight. But that degree of insight which seeks deepest into the life of things is the truest. And the purpose of our concentration processes is always to break through into causes, into the very facts and substances, into the deepest message and insight 
and to transform all objects into a mysterious celestial language by means of which we can read the way of the infinite through created things. Thus, if we take a tree or a flower or a plant or a concentration symbol, we may first say that it is very beautiful. And because perhaps we are a little hurt by life, we like to escape the beauty. Here is peace. Here is tranquility. Here is the calmness that perhaps our tired souls desire. But all this is of ourselves only. So wonderful as it may appear, this flower, this plant, is not really stillness or quietness or calmness at all. It is life. Life ever moving, ever dynamic, ever creative. It is just as real, just as dynamic, as the life around us which we find so burdensome and exhausting and weary. The reason why we are not aware of these things is because by its very nature the flower conceals most of the machinery of its own striving and its own struggle. Its growth is so slow we cannot see it. But in the course of days we notice the changes. So actually, while we may be seeking rest, our symbol is itself an emblem of motion, is an emblem of dynamic. If it is not dynamic, it is not alive. So we go on from perhaps concentration as this moment of poise in a day of stress and begin to seek not our own comfort, but the greater wisdom of things. And slowly our concentration symbol proceeds to ask us questions. And this flower, which has no tongue, demands answers. These answers can only be discovered by contemplation, by drawing upon the deepest resources of ourselves, by using all that we have ever learned or studied or known pointing all knowledge toward the simple answer, what is a tree, what is a flower, why are these things, and what do they mean to us. In the time, of course, the flower or the tree will take on greater and more living importance. We will begin to see in it the long shadow of laws, of principles, truth and processes. Perhaps our own false doctrines will be naturally censored by this silent blossom. Although it has no tongue, it speaks with an infinite number of voices calling upon us in myriad ways to search in ourselves for the meaning of everything that exists. So as time goes along in this meditational process, perhaps we shall pass beyond the flower or beyond the tree. We shall see it gradually fade away because we have passed through its shape or shadow and are again searching its substance, which like our own is formless. But always as we proceed, we shall be experiencing something of life. We shall be sharing intuitively in a process of wonderful discovery. It will seem as though innumerable centers of life burst in our consciousness, opening like flowers, telling us things that previously we had not dared that we would ever know. And this way, our concentration moves into dynamics. It moves into meaning and power. It goes on. No longer merely a process of looking at something, 
or even trying to forget everything else and staring ourselves into an astigmatism. This is not it. It is by degrees a wonderful relaxation in which it seems as though our discoveries are sort of floated in the air around us. With almost no effort, we keep on growing simply because we no longer resist growth. Growth is effortless unless man chooses to force or distort its processes. In this way, we gain a sharing in an adventure of life. A fellow has written to me and asked me if mathematical symbols are suitable uh, for the mandala processes. They most certainly are. For one of the oldest masters of these sacred arts was Pythagoras of Samos, to whom the world is indebted for many of its most basic mathematical discoveries. A great and wonderful mandala from more than 47 months actually invented by the government. Other a wonderful mandala processes are the symbols of number. Place a carved representation of it on a stand before it. And in the presence of this number, we may be absorbed in the entire mystery of that history. Or if he can exhaust the number of one, he will exhaust all numbers which arise in it and return to it again. He will exhaust all principles. For it is representative of the principle of truth. He will gradually come to know all processes and all miracles of creation. How does such a discovery vary from the simple study of math, or of geometry, or of trigonometry and The difference is very obvious. You may study things. And if you study your mathematics as a small boy, you will learn that two and two make four. And having made this discovery, you will be very wise in your own conceit. And hopelessly, you will go on. You will multiply and add and divide. And you will work out problems to discover how many square feet there is or there are in the floor, or how many apertures. There are in a certain amount of air space. You can learn all kinds of things. You can also go into spiracles and we do all kinds of trigonometrical formulas. But if you are merely learning to add up a grocery bill <coughs> or to work out some plan in mechanics or to discover some abstract principle of perspective, that which you attain is measured by that which you desire to attain. Thus you may be a mathematician without ever having sense in mathematics the mystery of the universe. You may intellectualize and say, well, in mathematics we have our single person. Even this does us no good. Oh, the world is full of certainty, which, though true in themselves, still leave us ignorant. Mathematical formulas which lead to the contemplation are like those of the Tetrachus Professor, the Pyramid of God, or the mysterious development of the inner surfaces and dissections and bisections of truth and many other relating to Kohen and uh, various mysteries of them. All of these, as Pythagoras pointed out, can lead to illumination, but not unless uh, they are approved by concentration, by the contemplative method, having discovered 
as Plato so wisely noted, the God geometry. If the universe is a magnificent formula, man can come to experience this formula by aid of numbers. However, he can study numbers and never experience this formula at all. He may be like the man who lives in the great city and never visits its art galleries or its museums or its places of interest until a country relative comes to visit. That we are in the midst of knowledge does not mean that we must know. It only means that we have the opportunity to know if we so desire and so apply ourselves. Other persons in various interests and activities have also wanted to know if their peculiar interests suitable for contemplation. Here the Tibetan and the Japanese and the Chinese mystic tell us the simple fact of life. All trades are among us. All professions are among us. Every art and craft is in the dollar. For actually there is no form of knowledge that exists which is not a key to universal. For nothing can function adequately. No science can be perfected. No art can be matured, except by cooperation with universal law. The law is in everything. It is the privilege of man to find the law. He may find it in the most complicated researches in physics and astronomy. He may find it in the actuarial tables of an insurance company. Whatever he is doing, he is achieving because he is moving in a law. Now, the fact that he knows this, however, will not save him nor serve him over well. He may have a what strange respect for it. He may be able to toss it away and say the universe is wonderful. He is not speaking untruly but he is speaking without libido, without energy, without meaning. It is only when, for a particular purpose, he takes hold of his knowledge and decides to grind, mold, or trim from this knowledge a key by which he can unload or unlock the mystery of total knowledge. Only then is this knowledge of value, of lasting spiritual significance to himself. If we know that a tailor cannot cut his cloth or a sailmaker his sail without the infinite being present, we gain a new respect for the dignity of simple things. And this is good. Because if Truth was only to be found in the most remote or rare or inaccessible of places. The majority of mankind could have no share in it. But truth is more common than the common man. It is more available and inevitable than any product that we have. One of the old alchemists said that the secret and substance of the stone is not rare or difficult although that which is produced from it is rare and difficult. The materials necessary for the rose diamond are more common than the earth upon which we walk, and each man every day throws away the substances of the elixir of eternal life. The symbolism is adequate enough, regardless of how we may feel about this particular concept. In her uh, in investigations into the Hermetic Mystery. Mary Atwood, one of the last of the great philosophical alchemists, uh, gave a wonderful insight into the alchemistical mysteries of transmutation and projection. She sensed, although not able completely to unfold her project, that all these symbols of alchemical processes had to do with concentration disciplines. That they were chemistries and alchemies taking place within the consciousness of man himself. 
and that in some mysterious way the base metal was dead knowledge. This had to be rescued and transformed into living truth. The elaborate chemistry by which this transmutation can take place is concealed in the basic writings of such old masters as Bacillus Valentinus and Eugenius Philalithi. These knew, they realized that the great search for the golden lion, the powder of eternal projection, by which all things were transmuted from seemingness into substance, that this was an attained internal vision, which could be then directed upon anything, and that thing upon which it was directed received it like light into its soul and blossomed and bore its fruit, and all substances became medicines for the healing of the sickness of ignorance. These contemplations, very mystical in their interpretation and in their wording, are strangely factual, however, when we come uh, to the experiencing of them. Words and descriptions are more difficult than actual processes themselves. So in our concentration thinking, we have to do with this uh, problem of bringing realities to life. The alchemist described this by rolling away the stone of the tomb so that the universal Messiah could rise from his grave. Thus the resurrection of Christ signified to them the resurrection of the realities in things the victory of life over death, of truth over fact, of reality over substance. This truth, again, this achievement, must occur within ourselves. And this is achieved through the victory of the experience over the intellectually contemplated. For experience is alive. But thoughts and argument and debate, these are not alive. We can believe anything and remain as we are. But when we experience something, we are changed. We are changed utterly. Something is added that can never again be taken away. So it is this experiencing and the conscious ability to benefit from experience, to accept experience to judge it for its true worth. These are the elements which help us to self-realization, uh, to the unfoldment of the powers and principles that are locked within ourselves. Now, there are several points this evening which we want to take up because I think they are more or less valuable. And in looking over chapter 7 in particular, I was impressed by the fact that in the years that have followed the writing of this book, my studies in the substance of the transcendent being is based upon Chinese metaphysics have been advanced considerably over the years. Therefore, while the substance is unchanged as far as what is contained in the book is on his concern, we have additional material and commentary which may be added this particular phase of the problem. To give some basic points in connection with the transcendent field in the chapter 7, which we mentioned, and also something of the Chinese metaphysics uh, by which this concept has gained uh, general recognition, where it is first known to us in certain Chinese metaphysical works. But in the study of the transcendent being, uh, we can go further. In the uh, old description, this being is another self, an interior nature that gradually comes to have an existence of itself. 
as the embryo is carried in the body of the mother, so the transcendent being is locked in the heart of the disciple. As the child is finally born to have a separate and complete existence in itself, so ultimately the transcendent being is born. And in its birth and in its uh, achievement of its own mature and individual state, uh, the result uh, means an important and wonderful transformation in man. A transformation uh, suggested in Greek mysticism in the chain from the chrysalis to the butterfly. And the use of the butterfly is the symbol of the liberated soul of man. The transcendent being is originally in man the germ of his realized self. The transcendent being is born when the individual begins to doubt uh, whether things are as they appear to be. When he begins to doubt that he is just body, when he begins to doubt whether he must do exactly as he feels, uh, when he begins to doubt that common knowledge is all knowledge, when these uncertainties begin to stir within him a certain inquiry, it is said that there gradually takes shape within his nature another being, and that this being continues to grow or unfold, as Goethe describes in Faust, where he says that there are two spirits competing in the flesh, that one of these spirits is nobler than the other, that one of these spirits is forever striving to lift man up to a greater achievement, and the other is constantly lulling him back into the rest of immaturity. We all have the double experience of this creature, so that we are sort of split personalities, regardless of whether it is so diagnosed or not. In these divisions of ourselves, there always seems to be one part that is the leader. If we are very materially poised, then the material part is the leader. If gradually, however, we sense that materiality is inadequate, then something else begins to take over. And we can divide these two natures into a basic idealist and a basic materialist. The materialist is a creature of its own comforts and desires. The idealist is a striver, a seeker, a spirit of discontent moving in us and moving us continually. The moment it comes to our realization that we can be better than we are, the nagging of this better self begins. It never seems to be willing to let us rest. And even in our securities and in our successes, it whispers to us that we have failed in something greater. After a time, this voice, like the voice of conscience, becomes a burden upon the spirit. We can no longer resist it. It is continually impelling us to seek and to strive, to recognize that there are distant horizons which must yet be explored. It is like the double nature of the man who stays at home, but in his dreams adventures through the seven seas. And there is this adventurer in us, that is forever striving to break away from the general and the accepted and search the more distant and wonderful atmospheres for greater things. In time, this transcendent being becomes a sort of alterable. It becomes our friend, developing a kind of personality in itself. In it we are investing continuously all those attributes and qualities which find no expression in our outer life. The transcendent being becomes a sharer in our dreams, in our hopes, 
in our inner conviction. It becomes our friend in time of trouble. And as we turn more continuously to the inner part of ourselves for understanding, we seem to find it there. And in one way or another, we create an ever more visual image, something that becomes increasingly real until there are moments when it seems difficult to decide whether this transcendent being is ourselves or whether this outer person we have known so long is the real self. In the Chinese metaphysics, it is taught that as time goes on, this transcendent being gradually absorbs into itself the energies and power that were originally vested in the outer personality. In due course, the, the rulership of life, the center of consciousness, moves from the personal, physical perspective of objectivity to love and becomes identified with the transcendent being. This being then becomes the real self. And it, it has absorbed the lesser self and becomes a living thing in itself, having created for its habitation a mysterious garment of energy, which we call the soul. So that actually, from this soul substance, we fashion a new instrument of expression. We give a new kind of body, which is not of the earth, but a body which is a vestment of heaven. And having created this body, we finally move into it, inhabit it, and discover in it our normal instrument. For well, the ancients were convinced man was created and basic, a human soul. The body was a strange and distant and unwieldy thing, not natural to man. But that man inevitably seeks to escape from the domination of body and return to the psychic substance which is his true nature. Thus man becomes a living soul. And this soul is his proper instrument and vehicle in which he then again involves and evolves, passing from one condition to another until he exhausts the mystery of soul as he is now seeking to exhaust the mystery of body. This transcendent being, this intuitional overself, is therefore as close to us as our own ability to sense it. And in meditation and in the various mystical disciplines, there are processes which encourage uh, the development of this transcendent nature. Man turning from the consideration of temporal things to those things which are internal and eternal naturally gives the weight of his energy, his creative processes, and his experience mechanisms to this inner growth. And this growth, therefore, gradually matures. Uh, the opposite situation is fairly obvious to us in psychological problems. For where the individual misuses his psychic content, where he becomes burdened by false attitudes, where he permits complexes and neurotic tendencies to take control, then he sickens his psychic life, which becomes a burden to him, and becomes the opposite of a transcendent being rather appearing in the awful likeness of some monster or demon, threatening to destroy his normalcy and his peace of mind. But as surely as dissipation, corruption, and indifference breed their own monsters in the silence of our psychic selves, so the path of discipleship transforms all this and transforms the bitter guardian up at the threshold of the astral life into the blessed and truly glorious soul likeness by which we gain this instrument of liberation and spiritual integrity.
Thus the transcendent being in the Chinese way of life is something that we gradually come to know and understand. And uh, one day we step across the bridge and the better self becomes the one and only self. Whereas today there is division in our midst, conflict and uncertainty, a little aspiration and a great deal of resignation to negation. This uh, development of the transcendent nature has been given a great deal of thought, particularly in Asia, and probably is the answer to many unsolved questions relating to the extrasensory perception range and to the projection of consciousness and intelligence from one place to another. For this higher being possesses much greater aptitude and much stronger abilities than those which we know in our daily living experiences. According to the Chinese, this transcendent being can travel around the world. It can go to the most distant places. It flies through the air on the back of a crane, or rides a phoenix through the clouded sky. It is the uh, mysterious being of inspiration. It is that which seemingly can dart instantly into the highest parts of the sky, penetrating with its inner vision into the deepest secrets of the universe. This transcendent being is therefore full of powers which we experience only in shadow or in part, but the reality of which we seem to sense. Also this transcendent being it represents not only the image of power, but the image of integrity. It is forever reminding us uh, that uh, only by certain procedures may we achieve to this Taoist paradise where the immortals gather around the peak tree of eternal youth. All of these principles and processes have their rules and laws. None can be broken. And the universe is in every part of itself, completely and totally honest, accepting only honesty from those to whom it gives its richer blessings. So the way to immortality, as found in the mysterious journey of the hung soldiers, is a very different and very peculiar path in correspondence to our daily thinking. It is not something that we can easily sense or understand, but which only gradually dawns upon us as we begin to seek in our own natures for the secrets of life. In the uh, Chinese, for example, also, great emphasis is placed upon the motivations behind the various achievements of men. There are two primary ends which the human being can conceive in connection with knowledge. One is the glorification of himself, that he becomes one who knows, that he shares in this wonderful gnosis of things about which the ancients have written so much. And the second uh, end is that he becomes the servant of knowledge, that actually he does not desire to possess. Rather, he desires to become possessed by these things which are true and right. One seeks mastery and the other to become the good and faithful servant. And the Chinese point out that the only one who can ever truly achieve is the one who dedicates himself as the servant. And woe to those who seek to master for their own gain. For to them, the illusion thickens and darkens. Every effort which they make is clouded by their own motives. And little by little, they are led along paths of self-deceit until everything becomes so confused and impossible that they are truly forlorn and helpless. Therefore, early in the disciplines of things, all self-interest must be. For self-interest is the parent of illusion. From self-interest, 
as from the mysterious Hydra with its seven heads. One evil after another is born, and for every head that is cut off, seven more grow. Self-interest is in all things the secret of error. And even in our most common, objective daily life, there is nothing that more quickly condemns us to misery than self-interest. Yet we live in a time in which, apparently, self-interest is universal. Now, who shall say that the Chinese are less materialistic than we are? There are very few indeed who can out-bargain the Chinese. They have struggled long for the very sustenance which they need for survival. They are shrewd in barter and exchange, and in many ways are the most materialistic of people. Yet, from them we have had this wonderful doctrine, this Taoistic concept of total freedom from self-interest. How shall we understand this? I think one old Chinese scholar who happened to have been more or less contemporary, and whom I knew many years ago, answers the thing very simply. He says, most people uh, get along reasonably well because they do not understand how to work their own vices. Uh, they think they're bad, but they're just foolish. Actually, it takes a great deal of skill to be bad. And it takes a great deal of concentration to develop a full-blown case of self-interest. Self-interest to the average person is just about his, about as superficial as his truth-seeking. Uh, self-interest is something that's important to him if it's easy. He doesn't make much effort on his own part. He can get what he wants without trying too hard. Or if he thinks he is taking care of his own activities and desires, then he is satisfied to relax and let someone else win the battle. Self-interest does not lead this person to a tremendous sacrifice of his own inertia, even here and now. It takes even more than self-interest to raise the horizontal human being to a vertical position. So self-interest is as half-baked as every other attitude, and consequently does but very little harm. We had years ago an epidemic of individuals trying to do yoga exercises. They really worked at it terrifically for anywhere from two to three days. And of course, if they had a large enough investment, they might last for a week or two. But during the course of that week or two, they had already broken every rule of the art or of the discipline. This was as it should be. These persons practiced their yoga so badly, so poorly, so irregularly, and so foolishly that it really didn't do them any harm. If they had been more sincere, the insanity rate would have gone up very rapidly. But they did not work hard at it, not hard enough even to make themselves sick. They couldn't have done it right. They did not know how. But they did not have patience to do it wrong. So in a few days, not getting immediate results, they were off to some shorter path. Nothing happened except a little loss of money, a little loss of time, and perhaps a few bad cases of nerves. In the same way, self-interest, which is such a deadly enemy to these problems, would be much more dangerous if man had the stamina to even be selfish consistently. But he does not. Occasionally, one does have this degree of stamina and gets into rather serious trouble. But for the most part, our self-interest is not deep set. It is mostly a cultivation of creature comforts. It is a series of lazy decisions, not motivated by any great amount of ill, but simply lacking the stamina of rightness. So our negative situations are not helpless or hopeless or terrible. 
nor will self-interest in most cases cause us serious difficulties. The only thing that we must remember is that if we continue to cultivate it in a half-hearted manner, it will delay the gradual integration of the personality, which must be built upon certain basic convictions. Uh, the person does not need to get too regretful or blame himself too much. It is simply wiser to assume that the moment we understand, at that moment we gain a new responsibility to live according to what we understand. What went before, we may as well release it. Rather than trying to be sorry or work some weird penance uh, to seek the forgiveness for our sin. Most people are not really successful sinners uh, to the degree that a great repentance is indicated. They're just neither hot nor cold, and the Bible says that these have a difficult time. In the uh, development, then, of all these disciplines, the motivation is gradually to eliminate uh, the various elements which go to make up the self-pressure pattern, where self-pressure is perhaps even more obvious than self-interest as we know it, although the two terms are difficult sometimes to differentiate. Actually, we sit in a kind of judgment perpetually over the things we see and the experiences that pass through our consciousness. We say to ourselves, this is a symbol of this. This experience means this. We have all decided it. We know exactly according to our preconceptions how we are going to accept what we term to be fact. And always we are seeking to justify the previous structure of beliefs, those attitudes which we hold most closely and cherish most intimately. We are therefore living forever to prove that we are right. We are constantly bewildered and disappointed when we realize how right we are and how wrong everything goes that we have anything to do with. We can only conclude that the universe is disorderly. It is impossible for us to deserve anything but the best. And as we seldom get it, universal ethics has gone awry. This removal of the personal equation is the beginning of honest experience. In meditation and concentration particularly, it is most important that we do not interpret the truth out of everything that we experience. And in an effort to not make these mistakes as we go along, there is this need for an occasional pause uh, to look into ourselves more intimately. In concentration, our own honesty is our most valuable instrument. And our own honesty means, for the most part, a complete suspension of judgment. Honesty is a very difficult thing to define in its detail or in its actual substance. We say that certain things are honest and certain things are dishonest and we try to be honest, but we really are toying with words rather than ideas. The only safe way to be honest in an interior experience is simply to suspend all judgment. The moment we try even to be most honorable, we are limited by our own concept of what is honorable, or by the world concept, or by the concept of our neighbors, or the dictates of our religion. We are never sure just exactly what this honesty is. And the best way to try to find out is to sort of remove ourselves from the picture and let the facts have their own work. Realizing always that if we are able to suspend our own personalities, then we can accept 
unconditioned experience. So it's one thing to try to do this, and it's another thing to achieve it. Because many of our dishonesties are subconscious. And many of the other elements in which we have uncertainties in this department are along lines of very special feelings which we have nurtured and nursed with great love and attention for a long time. We have cuddled many of the weakest and worst phases of our own natures. And our honesty, which must be a suspension of personal judgment, cannot escape from the interferences and inroads of personal likes and dislikes. Judgment is one thing. Intensity is another. And where judgment is suspended, intensity, intensity may come along and destroy everything. So we look back over the problem of the life and we recognize the cathartic disciplines as set forth for us. The vital necessity of suspending all of these habit patterns which affect our temperaments adversely. Now, I know many people who have great respect for the brotherhood of man, but they've never been able to find a brother they could live with. Humanity is wonderful except those that they know. These same people are utterly dedicated to the service of people they have never met. Because these people they have never met appreciate them tremendously. They're sure of it. But the people they have met do not seem to appreciate them so well. And as a result, there is less sympathy and rapport, shall we say. It is also very easy for us to be extremely patient in matters where we have no interest. We can be more tolerant of how the Chinese or the Greeks run their affairs uh, than even appears to be necessary. We simply cannot tolerate the way our own children run their affairs. Now we're in a personal situation. So we can forgive everybody whom we have never heard of. We can get along with everyone we've never met. And we have a fair ability to rise to those monumental heights in which we are able to be patient with individuals who do exactly what we want them to. Such virtues as these overwhelm us, but they mean nothing when we try to grow. Actually, each one is blocked in his growth by the negative aspects of his own temperament. Unless he really goes to work on himself, he is never going to be able to break through into these areas in which inner strength will be available to meet the pressing need of the day. Now, persons who have not accomplished all these wonderful ends can still be tremendously useful people. A good intention, a good resolution. This also helps tremendously. And it is part of the way in which nature permits us to grow. Nature does not issue any ultimatum at the early period of the growth of anything. Nature never at any time points a finger at someone and says, you shall not do this. Nature works in a very subtle and general manner, but its ways are irresistible. Thus the person who has not made these grand achievements, grown as we discipline ourselves, our vision increases with our efforts. Here also, then, is the end of pressure and tension of growing. The individual who is experiencing inwardly does not have to fight negative habits. Whereas otherwise we must continue to try very hard to keep principles we believe within our own lives.
we are not achieving a certain amount of discipline integration. So all these things make a lot of sense and a lot of uh, problem for us, but I wanted to take them up because I felt that they would add something to this study. In Chapter 7, we have a further consideration of the problem of the adept self. The time this book was written, there was very little known about certain phases of, of man's subconscious structure. And the hero self, the adept self, the teacher self, the guardian self, these were not differentiated parts of the psyche. Yet we know that in ancient times, these differentiations were known and recognized. And therefore, that they did play their part in the philosophical and psychological symbolism of alchemy. The adept self certainly represents the teacher within. The adept self represents again the transcendent being and the transcendent nature of man, the over self, uh, Emerson's oversoul, or the Gnostic Anthropist. This uh, principle means that each person is seeking to reach the source of his own necessary instruction. And this source of instruction lies at the root of that differentiation of consciousness which he calls himself. To reach this over self, so that to use the Eastern phrase, the voice of a silence can be heard means distinctly to create bridges or, or instruments of interpretation by means of which the higher nature of the person can move smoothly and adequately into objective consciousness. We have become so tremendously involved in the reception of image from exterior sources. We have so learned to think of the sensory perceptions as instruments for the recording of environmental phenomena that we have overlooked what the ancients knew, namely that all sensory perceptions are two-way roads. But just as surely as these perceptions must convey environment into us so likewise, these roads must be the channel through which the self moves out into its environment. The uh, psychologist today really regards the self as poised between two pressures. The pressure of the world on the outside and the pressure of a sick self on the inside. To him, most of the psychic pressure that we experience is negative. He senses psychic pressure as the cause of sickness, as the cause of delusion, or as breaking through in trance and vision, or in dreams, trying to tell us what is wrong, and why it is that we are unable to achieve the integration of functions which we so desperately need. It does not seem to occur to these people that this message from the inside should be essentially a good message. That this should be the source of strength. That it is from the inside that all of the healing power of nature flows out into the outer life. That the interior is the source of inspiration and aspiration but it is the source of holy strength, divine insight, and the courage to do all things well. Because, however, 
we have neglected uh, this other self. We are not able to enjoy these advantages. Instead of this, we have aborted the process so that what we now consider as the inside pouring out is not so at all. What we have done is set up in the psychic area a mirror. And on this mirror, the outside is reflected into the individual and then reflected out again. So that what seems to be coming from the outside is merely that part of objective experience which has filtered in. And we have, therefore, really the outside operating upon us from two polarities, its own natural polarity and its reflected polarity in our own psyche. Because of the pressure of this reflection, because the psyche has become a net which has captured objectivity and has been in many ways contaminated by that which it has captured. The road between the adept self and the centers of awareness in brain-mind function are blocked or are restricted. And the individual who thinks he is moved by pressures from within himself, is merely moved by reflection of world pressure, which having reached into him, is now coming out again. And because of the direction it is traveling, he gives it an importance which is not its own. He says it comes from the inside, therefore it is me. I am speaking, this is my will. This is my purpose. This is my freedom of choice. Therefore, I must live and die for it. He feels this simply because it seems to be coming from within him. But actually, the psychologist is right in assuming that these things that seem to come in, to come from within, were actually planted in there by artificial means. They are not his real nature or his own personality. They are only his degree of social unadjustment, reflected out again, and burdening his entire psychic life. Locked in this struggle, it is only in our life completely dominated by externals, just as his outer life is. The person is incapable of being a channel for the transmission of any true psychic energy. He cannot know himself, because a veil of not-self has now been placed within him as well as on his outer personal consciousness. The only answer to this is to gradually release oneself from this false falling inward, or else to recognize its true nature and discount it accordingly. Until the confusion caused by the use of the psychic instrument for reflective purposes only, until this confusion is solved, the individual looking toward the interior of himself sees nothing with distinctness. He is unaware of the nature of himself. He cannot even be certain when he looks in that he can find a self. And in the subconscious experiences, only certain fragments of emotion or thought seem to rise from the depths of the unknown and float upon the surface of consciousness. Where they come from, what they mean, why they are, he does not know or really have any instrument to discover. All he does know, however, is that while this turmoil exists, the transcendent being is silent. While all these confusions reign, the oracles do not speak. And as man depends actually for his true existence upon the oracles, it is important that they should speak, and he must find some way of causing them 
uh, to what are their sacred sentences. In this, the adept self, therefore, we have the concept of a true internal being that is not the product merely of the confusion of man's psychological lack of integration. This psychic self is not merely the product of heredity and environment. It is a nature of itself. Science is uh, disconcerted by this because it is um, not willing to accept the possibility of an immortal principle in man. At least it is loath to accept such a principle. It is deceived and confused by this reflection which it considers rather rightly to be only passed from the outside. Looking and seeing nothing but this, science decides that man has no interior, that there is nothing more than can be seen. The reason no more can be seen, however, is because the obscuration conceals the fact. The only way in which what is truly there can be known is when man is able to relax away from these false psychic processes. This again is one explanation for discipline. These disciplines must clear the psychic field. They must liberate man from the dominance of external. Buddha is very definite on this point. It sounds like he wants everyone to be an ascetic. Such is not the meaning. What Buddha is trying to tell us is that while man mistakes the world for himself, simply because this world appears to him coming from within himself, as long as this mistake endures, the individual must suffer. And there is no end to the misery of ignorance, so long as man is moved only by ignorance in himself. To cure, to cure this must result, must uh, demand, therefore, a certain detachment. A detachment that is not cold, that is not indifferent, but is still sufficient enough to enable the person to free himself from these familiar patterns and habits which he has come to believe to be himself. Therefore, when a man is angry, he says, I am angry, and he believes it. But it is not actually true, because the I am in man is not angry. Another man says, I'm sick. What he means is his body is sick, or his mind is sick. And as he has no knowledge of himself, except through these instruments, he identifies his own nature with them. By reducing these pressures, however, by gradually relaxing the attachment with objectivity, the person removes the mirror. He takes away this instrument of reflection. He does not toss back everything that the world shows, because for him, the position of the light by which a shadow can be cast has been changed. When the light is on the outside, it casts a shadow upon him. But when the light is on the inside, his own nature is unshadowed. This is no time, the Japanese concept of shadow. For in Japan, uh, which is essentially dominated by Buddhist art principles, shadows are not used because bodies are shadows. And who wants to have a shadow casting another shadow? It just doesn't mean anything. And... Uh, uh, the uh, Buddhist painter will say, well, actually, you know yourself that the shadow isn't real. It's only the relation of the light to the object. 
The object does not substantially change. It only appears to change. Well, why make a picture of an illusion? Why not make the picture of the thing as it really is? Or as nearly as we can, without allowing it to be shadowed, or to pass shadows, which are not of its own substance, and for that matter are of no substance of whatever. But these reflections in the life of man are like these shadows. And we have taken the shadows for substances too long. And it is the purpose of the disciplines of self-development to cause the individual to escape from the shadow-casting formula. He casts no shadow, and he permits no shadow to be cast upon his own soul. And if the light is where it belongs, the light will cast no shadow. And the psychic self is free from this burden of appearances which have no substance or essence. As long as we cater to these impulses which are being reflected out from within us, we continue to strengthen them, become more and more addicted to them, come to accept them as real, and finally build our whole way of life upon them a way of life that has never produced anything actually except misery for mankind. Before the little hour of pleasure, he has taken ages of war and crime and death. He could have had the pleasure without the pain, had he been wiser. But he sought more sincerely for the truth and not the shadow. Now we also have under consideration this evening another important element of philosophical discipline, and this is the exercise of retrospection. And here again, we are following a Greek formula. For the oldest accounts that we have of the discipline of retrospection are associated with the Institute of Pythagoras at Crotona, a Dorian colony in Italy, where he created his school. Pythagoras believed uh, that it was important to keep a constant circulation of vital energy in the consciousness of man. One way to protect yourself against suffering, mental, emotional, or physical, is to prevent bad habits from being formed. Preventive medicine is always better than curative medicine. And he therefore set up a process for the cleansing of the life through a regular discipline called retrospection. The uh, purpose of retrospection was to do things now and to reject procrastination or to prevent a single mistake being multiplied before it is corrected. A person does a thing once. This is no habit. Twice. It is still no habit. Several times, habit begins to appear. A dozen times, and it is a habit. A hundred times, and it's incurable. This gradual building of habit mechanism applies to the mind as well as to the processes of the body. Bad bodily habits are very hard to correct and frequently cause serious health problems. Bad mental and emotional habits are more insidious, but as a consequence are far more dangerous. Now what are the most common habits <coughs> with which we might be concerned? Probably in our daily living, our most consistently bad habit is thoughtlessness. It seems just too much of an effort was to reason out everything. And a large part of our day is spent in the performance of comparatively mechanical actions. 
Oh, yes, we may have to vitalize them a little. Give a tiny bit of libido to them, just so that they won't cease entirely. But uh, we do not, for the most part, give even important things sufficient thoughtfulness. We also are born procrastinators. Never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. And never do tomorrow what you can put off till next week. For there's always the possibility, as Bismarck said, that by next week no one will care whether you ever do it or not. And you have saved yourself a considerable amount of effort. Now this works sometimes, but other times doesn't work at all. And procrastination, generally speaking, pays off very badly. Pythagoras pointed out that everything that we do in life should either be done on purpose or not done at all. This letting things happen, uh, this comparative indifference, which we hope to use later as a justification. In other words, we didn't care much, so we didn't give it much attention. It went badly. Well, it isn't really our fault. If we thought more about it, we could have done something about it. So it goes into infinity. Pythagoras believes that the individual who lives stocklessly will die miserably because he will ultimately develop a habit, a habit of sloppy thinking. And for the most part, when we look around us today, this habit has taken over. There has never been a time in the history of man when sloppy thinking was as fashionable as it is today. It has practically uh, dominated the field of intellect. We do not care. We are indifferent. Nothing seems very important. Decisions are procrastinated and delayed and perhaps never made. All of this leads to a gradual weakening of our control of ourselves and certainly destroys any directive or objective with which we may be concerned. We have therefore developed not only the be little attitude, but we have now perfected in what we call the go nowhere attitude. We do not care where we are going. We have a hope that in some mysterious way we will drop into a quiet grave before everything goes to pieces. We are not concerned about uh, the future of ourselves or others. And this collective carelessness, this indifference bred by generations of sloppy thinking, will sometime come to a head to perhaps destroy our culture at a very vital moment. Pythagoras, therefore, believed that the wise man must always be in control of his processes, of his thoughts and of his emotions. He must also learn the way that we can all learn, and that is by fact. But all arguments and discussions and diagrams and theories are very secondary when compared to living facts. Now, if we had no living facts, we might have to depend upon theories. But we do have living facts. And our own lives is one of those facts. Well, Pythagoras decided that for his disciples, there should be a discipline practice every evening, a practice for a very brief period of man-made time, for in the mysterious dimensions of thought and meditation, time becomes ethereal, as in the case of dreams, but a whole life may unfold in a few moments. About five, maybe ten minutes at the most, perhaps even less, of man-made time is sufficient for the individual to go back through his life in a reverse order. 
from the night to the morning, for his retrospection is limited to one day. It occurs each day and covers in each day that day itself, while every memory is still vivid, while other circumstances have not intervened or new interests have not shifted our perspective. The purpose is to experience our living as a series of small causes and effects. In daily living, we experience from cause to effect. In retrospection, we reverse this and experience from effect to cause. This philosophical insight is especially valuable because it reminds us that with the lives of those around us, we can only experience from effect to cause. The things that we see around us are all effects to which we must attribute causes and the causes of which we must discover. And having discovered them, we must evaluate them. But in our own lives, we have this peculiar ability to live the same experience twice, in different arrangements, or in reverse order. So we say to ourselves, this morning I said something that was rather critical and uncalled for. I hurt someone. And this night, Looking back over that day, I try to understand why, what caused it, and also what the effects were. Later in the day, this person to whom I had said the unpleasant word was not friendly, but went away, and I did not see them for the rest of the day. I had hurt them. This hurt and this disappearance of the other person now comes first. We say to ourselves, this person was hurt. Who hurt them? I did. How did I hurt them? And we proceed to unfold in reverse procedure the entire process of what we said. Then we seek to find out why we said it. And we go back perhaps as far as we can in that day. Perhaps the incident arose on a previous day. If so, it should have been covered by the retrospection of that day. And it is enough at this time merely to hitch it to the previous sequence. But out of this procedure of retrospection, we also come to certain decisions or conclusions. Everything that we do that is not as it should be, uh, carries with it a certain sense of guilt. Uh, Pythagoras did not believe in the vicarious atonement. He did not know of anything of the idea of pen penance for the forgiveness of sin. All these things were to come long after his day. But Pythagoras did believe that it was within the right of individuals to correct themselves. But when we have done something that we know not to be right, it is our privilege to accept the personal responsibility for that action, to honestly and sincerely regret it, to resolve that we will not repeat it, and to permit our mistakes to sink sufficiently into our consciousness so that it shall be a deterrent in the future from similar actions. If we think through the unkind things we say, or even the cruel thoughts we think, if we remember and reconstruct the results of gossip, and whom we have hurt, and how we have hurt them, and try to relive the damage we have done we are not likely to repeat the occurrence. But if we simply cast it aside and say, well, they'll have to take us as they find us, nothing happens, and the individual is all ready to make the same mistake again. 
Or if we are willing to say he deserved it and let it go at that, which most people use as an excuse, we can then repeat our error with a good spirit. But if through retrospection we break the whole process down, if we really understand what caused us uh, to have this unpleasant spell of temper, if we would really just face up to it and say, the reason I said what I said is now very obvious to me. I was just small and jealous. I was envious of something. I resented something. I myself have a load of psychic pain, and I'm going to take it out on someone. We think these things through straight and honestly. We gain a tremendous experience lesson. For we can relive our own occurrence, but we cannot relive anyone else's. We can bring back, as from the waste of time, this thing that we have done. We can know why we did it, and how we did it, and what we did. We can see just how wrong it was, or just how foolish it was, or how thoughtless, or how rude or crude. And from just self sense not some kind of a picking on ourselves, not a, a masochistic desire to appear to suffer, but from an honest, evaluation. We can place our own lives as we would place the life of a small child whom we were trying to bring up directly. We would realize what punishment is necessary, what the child needs in the form of correction and understanding, and we can administer it to the child in ourselves, for all weaknesses are signs of childishness. Now, I know definitely but some people who are having a great deal of trouble with themselves would never for one moment dare to perform a retrospection. It would cause their whole house of cards to fall down. Many people physically survive only on the strength of their own toxicity, and this is also true on the psychic level. Individuals live only to nurse their grievances. And if they face the truth and they realize the futility of their lives, they probably would be utterly disturbed. The uh, retrospection discipline, however, as we said, whenever begun, does not go back beyond the day. And whenever the disciple decides to be attempt it, he must accept it as it was given to him according to rules which he must follow. He is not expected to ask why. He is not expected to improve upon the theory, because it has stood the test of ages, and the average beginner is no condition to improve on anything. So he does not go back in his retrospection to all the horrid and lurid things that may have afflicted him for the last 50 years. He begins only with today. And he says to himself, as he goes back, this has been a very messy day. I have done many things that certainly were not kind. I have said things that I'm not sure were true. Now I sit down and think about them. I have fallen into very poor semantic habits. I have said to my to someone, anyone knows that chap's no good. This wasn't true. What I really said was, I don't like this fellow. And I exaggerated in order to give added pressure to my own opinion, or else to protect my own good name, so that others would not think I was unduly suspicious. I merely spoke for everyone else shifting the responsibility to the unknown. 
We sit down and think about that for a while. We will not exaggerate so much the next time. Then we can say to ourselves, I have passed judgment upon the work of another man. I said he was no good, that, he, that his job was poor, that anybody, including myself, could do it better. Can I do it better? A little thought may cause us to say I couldn't do it at all if the truth were not. I haven't the slightest idea of how to do it. What I merely was doing was criticizing. I was passing judgment on something I really am not equipped to judge. So little by little, we whittle away uh, this broad veil of generality, of uh, this wall, this network and framework with which we surround things. We just face the simple fact. I didn't feel good. Or I was angry. Or someone else had done something to me and I wanted to hit back. Or I lost my temper. Or the fellow was telling me something so true I hated him for it. These thoughts sober us. And in the quietude of our lives, we can go back over a day and sort of put it together. We can say, is there any pattern in my common faults for this day? Yes, there seems to be. I want to put off things all the time. Half a dozen times during the day, there are decisions I should have made, but I procrastinated them. Why? Was it because I didn't want to hurt someone else's feelings by an unpleasant decision? Or was it because I did not want my feelings to be hurt by their hurt feelings? There's a great difference between these two things. It's like not correcting the child because we don't enjoy the tantrum. What is the motive behind what we have done? Were we afraid? Would it have been to someone else's advantage? Have we done some little minor cheating by this deal? Have there been ulterior motive? Have we hidden valuable knowledge because it might have been used to the, another person's gain when it was their right to have that knowledge? Just how foolish, selfish, stupid, narrow-minded, and arrogant are we? These are refreshing thoughts. They are not refreshing at the moment, but they have a long-range utility. By degrees, we become honest. And there's no misery in honesty. And there's something very private about retrospection. You don't have to advertise it. You do not have to tell other people all your faults. You can modestly keep them to yourself. But you can also valiantly do something about them. Instead of confessing to someone, you can show that you understand by changing your ways in the future. Then there are all kinds of imponderables that move in upon us. Are we doing all that we can do in the society to which we belong? Do we think we can do things we can't do? Are we going out meddling in other people's affairs, not because we really know what we are doing, but because we like to regard ourselves important and hope others will do the same? Are we simply extroverting at the expense of society? Or are we neglecting the common and natural duties of life? Are we neglecting our families simply because we like to do certain things and the heck with them? What are the motives behind all these things? And by, by degrees, day by day, we can take ourselves to pieces and later put ourselves together again in a pattern closer to our heart's desire. We can become completely analytical, but never should we exaggerate. And Pythagoras pointed out, never should we sentimentalize. When we come upon some particularly 
unpleasant little incident of mayhem that we have committed somewhere along the line, we could break down and weep. We could say, oh, how horrible I was. This I can never forgive myself for it. It was simply terrible. I'll never do it again until next time. We can have great remorse. We can say, this is so terrible a thing that God could never forgive us. We have got to go and hang our heads for the rest of our lives. The Pythagoras warned against all these exaggerations and extravagances. Yet the untrained and untutored mind and emotions are subject to such exaggerations. But remember that we are sitting impersonally in judgment. We are like a judge. We are not likely to become greatly involved or to become really nasty to the culprit. The judge will pass sentence as impartially as possible, and unless the offense is particularly horrible, he will seldom have very much to say. The law will have its own way. In this way, also, we have to examine our own nature. Our purpose is to recognize that temperament and disposition and circumstances and incidents are part of life. We are expected to make these mistakes. We are expected to do things badly. We must inevitably commit faults until we take over the conscious administration of our own affairs. Until the day when we outgrow these weaknesses, we must have them. The crime is not in having them. The misfortune is that we must suffer because we have them. And suffer we will until we correct them. So we have no reason to become extravagantly despondent. What we have to do is face the facts as we would face the correction of a small child. To us, the small child's mistake may seem much more trivial than it does to the child, whose whole life may be to its own thinking hanging in the balance. Therefore, a simple, direct, factual conclusion with a thorough remembrance of the lesson. If we get too emotional or too much involved, we may never do anything again for fear that we'll do it wrong. This is not the answer. The answer is to try to measure each day by a code of analysis that is simple, direct, honest, broad and sweeping, yet penetrating. Each day will bring new experiences for which we will not always be prepared. But by retrospection, we also gain a general preparedness. We learn gradually in, say, a year or two of retrospective discipline to make all important decisions more slowly and cautiously. We count ten. We are not quite so certain of things we know nothing about. By degrees, we ask from others and usually obtain a leave of time to consider or investigate or examine things. We do not trust their judgment anymore, but we trust our own a little less and make certain that the facts are with us in these decisions. Gradually, this habit of prudence, beginning in retrospection, takes over at other times, and we become mindful during action of the retrospection of the previous evening. And we will say, look, I'm heading into this same situation again. This is twice. The first time it is anyone's fault. The second time it will be my own. So we gain a little more thoughtfulness. We may make the same mistake several times before we correct it entirely or before we have the courage uh, to make the decisions that would prevent the difficulty from coming. It is not that we have to grow instant. It is that we are trying sincerely to grow. 
and are gradually taking upon ourselves the direction of our own conduct as a proper responsibility intended by nature. As we lead our own lives, we have better lives, and we gain gradually control of these extremities by which we so misrepresent ourselves. Therefore, the law of retrospection, as it was practiced, this discipline, makes our own lives a textbook, and we are periodically examined on the assignment of the day, or of the week, or of the year. We are supposed to learn from this text, and to be able to answer certain reasonable questions. Tomorrow brings the question, for the day itself is the examination in which the previous knowledge is weighed, and we are given an opportunity to apply it to new situations. This simple way of learning passed from the Greeks to several other people, and it has come down to us through many societies and disciplined groups of thinkers. It is regarded as one of the most useful and basic of all philosophical instruments. And if properly practiced, even the most elementary situation will be improved. This practice does not depend upon our education, or our insight, or our philosophical and scholastic attainment. The most simple person can apply it just as wisely and just as well as the most highly intellectual individual. It may be that the person of more restricted activity will have fewer problems, less definition, and will make fewer mistakes. And this is interesting, because when we study the principle of retrospection in action, we find that the cultivated person, the intellectual, is the one who is in trouble the most. Simple people react rather directly. They react from certain uh, clear objectives and from certain basic values in their own nature. Civilized man, with a breadth of learning and a wide diversity of interests, is more easily confused and more quick to seek escape. He is better able to argue in his own defense. And of course, in retrospection, uh, it is like certain of the courts of Europe. The United States and its legal procedure is somewhat different from some of the European countries. In many countries, a person tried for a crime is not permitted to have an attorney. He is his own attorney, and there is no attorney against him. He simply presents his case, and the witnesses present their case, and the judge or jury come to the decision. There is no elaborate legal machinery as we know it. And in those nations, I'm not at all uh, sure that the justice is any less, perhaps it is greater, than we have here, with all our elaborate means of escaping the loopholes in the law. But in any event, uh, the individual of intellectual attainment is used to talking himself in and out of situations may also try to think himself in and out of his retrospection problems. But the moment he seeks to justify himself, the moment he explains why, other than in terms of fact, the moment he says to himself, well, I guess I wasn't feeling so good that day, he begins to compromise his principles. Things are so or not so. The retrospection merely clears the confusion that surrounds us. Unless it is honestly practiced, it is of no value whatsoever. And it cannot be honestly practiced if the individual practicing it is full of self-sympathy or is belligerently resolved to continue to assume that they are right and someone else is wrong. Everything must be upon value only. I've worked with people in connection with this type of discipline for many years, and it is notable how few persons base their antagonism 
and their unhappiness upon facts. Under analysis, it is not fact but temperament and disposition that press us on to unreasonable action. As soon as we realize this in retrospect, we are rescued from this pressure. We begin to think quietly and orderly, and we find that we like people better than we do, or that people have virtues and values which we have overlooked, and that one of the reasons why other people seem to be hard to get along with is because we are unwilling to accept these people, honestly. We must distort them to fit into some preconception of our own. I think retrospection, if thoroughly practiced, would help most persons out of a psychosis. Unfortunately, if the ailment has reached a disease proportion, the mind is no longer able to function. But for those who are under psychic stress and who have frustrations and neuroses and inhibitions which could easily turn into serious mental disorders, the retrospection process, if taken immediately, can be used to straighten out persecution complexes, negative fatalism, defeatism, and all this type of psychic pressure. The Greeks were very wise in this. Pythagoras was one of the wisest of the Greeks. He was regarded is speaking with the voice of an oracle, and his wisdom surpassed the wisdom of most men. And he has given us this law, which is good to practice, and which, if well practiced, will help us every day to grow that day by an orderly and consistent process. Well, it looks like it's about time for you to all practice retrospection. So we'll let you go for this week and hope to see you a week from tonight.